Welcome to the Microgen DX Miked Up Podcast. Discover how cutting-edge next-generation sequencing technology is revolutionizing medical diagnosis, empowering healthcare professionals with rapid and accurate identification of microbes. Our experts take you through the science behind microbiome testing so that you can make better decisions when it comes to patient care. Plus, hear stories from patients firsthand about their journey toward better health. Let's get started. So, um... Thanks for the opportunity to present today. I'm going to be giving a very brief overview of what next-gen sequencing actually is. Uh, The intention here is not to go into a tremendous amount of detail. Uh, Those questions can be answered by Rick's team, and we have Nick Stanford, one of the senior technological officers here. Uh, But instead, it's going to be a clinically focused overview uh, of NGS methods for clinical microbial detection. Just talking through, perfect. So what is uh, NGS? Well, it refers to a collection of high throughput DNA sequencing strategies that can process large amounts of data in a timely fashion. And it's typically in a massively parallel fashion with with millions or even billions of sequencing reactions occurring at the same time. Uh, And this parallel nature is really what differentiates it from traditional Sanger sequencing. There are two broad types, which I'll discuss very briefly in a bit more detail, but the first is 16S amplicon targeted NGS, which is what's actually done at Microgen. And the second is shotgun metagenomics, which is being done um, at a group at Mayo and also in in Oxford as well, and a couple of Chinese groups. So the first method, um, which is again used in in Texas, uh, targets the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. It encodes the 30S ribosomal subunit, uh, which is specific to prokaryotes. And so it has certain conserved regions, which are shown in blue across all bacteria. And in addition, there are variable regions V1 to V9, which are shown in red, that are specific to individual bacterial species. And so this gene is a starting point uh, for sequencing as it largely avoids that issue with interference from host eukaryotic DNA, which is present in a typical human clinical sample, uh, while still enabling the taxonomic classification that we need. Also of note, the ITS gene is used for fungal sequencing, but I'm not gonna go into that in too much detail. Uh, so this the 16S uh, gene is then amplified by forward and reverse primers, um, and then it's pulled and loaded onto a sequencing platform such as the Illumina MySeq, which is shown uh, on, on the slide here. And this uses an image-based detection or fluoroscopic detection method, which is known as uh, sequencing by synthesis. Um, so a fluoroscopic change is detected every time uh, a complementary nucleotide, tag nucleotide is incorporated into the DNA. And then the reads generated are denoised, and then there is a comparison using bioinformatics of the sequenced reads against a curated library of over 50,000 different organisms to generate both species level and, and genus level distinction. The second method, shotgun metagenomics, is different in that all the, the, the genomic de- material present is sequenced. And so what's not shown in this slide is that prior to this method, um, host extraction, a host DNA extraction kit is required to remove as much hu- human DNA as possible. Um, This is followed by fragmentation of the DNA present, then sequencing of those fragments, followed by repeated fragmentation, repeated sequencing, until you get contiguous segments that are overlapping. And those overlapping regions are then using computer analytic programs uh, used to assemble sequence reads, which are again compared against um, a library of, of known organisms. So why would you use one method over another? Well, 16S targeted sequencing was chosen at Microgen as it's it's a lower cost. Um, It's also good for lower microbial abundance regions such as the prosthetic joint. Um, And there's also established bioinformatic pipelines available. A majority of the Human Microbiome Project was done with this methodology. Uh, And and in addition, by targeting the 16S region, you're avoiding largely the issues with host DNA interference. But the trade-off is with the shotgun methodology, um, you get a better taxonomic resolution at the species level, um, and it also enables antibiotic resistance and functional understanding, which is not possible on 16S sequencing. And so the projections that you see with 16S sequencing are either based on PCR or uh, projections of antimicrobial resistance based on species identified. So irrespective of which of these two uh, techniques is is employed, the general pipeline follows this pathway. So samples are collected, DNA is extracted, and then, for example, for the Illumina MySeq, the DNA is tagged using custom adapter sequences, and then amplified on a solid surface with covalently attached DNA linkers, uh, and then loaded onto a pipeline such as the Illumina MySeq, and then reads generated are um, 
are compared against a curated library to enable taxonomic classification. Um, I know we're running short of time, but I wanted to finish with a summary video um, just so that everybody is able to see the, the pipeline pathway on the MySeq. It's a single strands and then captured on a solid surface. The attachment occurs through complementary base pairing with all of the nucleotides that are fixed to the surface. In the next step, PCR, DNA polymerase synthesizes a second strand of DNA starting from the annealed oligonucleotide, which serves as a primer. The two long strands are now separated, leaving one strand attached by a covalent bond to a fixed oligonucleotide. The DNA fragment can form a bridge with another fixed oligonucleotide, and another round of PCR proceeds. The strands are separated, followed by additional rounds of PCR. After many rounds, a small patch of DNA forms in the location of each original cellular DNA fragment. These single-stranded DNA molecules represent two sequences that are complementary to each other. Now, one of the strands is clipped at its attached oligonucleotide, leaving molecules of just a single DNA sequence. In this way, tiny islands of DNA form, with each containing many identical copies of a unique DNA sequence. The PCR step produces enough DNA template material for the following sequencing reactions. DNA sequencing begins with annealing a primer to the template. The primer is complementary in sequence to the adapter near the 3' end of the template. The primers provide a 3' hydroxyl group onto which DNA polymerase can begin to add nucleotides. The four types of nucleotides have fluorescently labeled groups that can distinguish them. DNA polymerase adds a nucleotide to the end of the primer. The added guanine-bearing nucleotide is complementary to the cytosine-bearing nucleotide in the template DNA. Note that the nucleotides have a blocking group on their 3' ends, so no additional nucleotides can be added at this time. The rest of the nucleotides are washed away. A laser induces the nucleotide to fluoresce, and the color is recorded. Each spot on the solid surface has a particular fluorescence, depending on which nucleotide was incorporated into the growing strand. The fluorescent label and the blocking group are now removed from the nucleotide. Because the blocking group can be removed, this type of nucleotide is called a reversible chain-terminating nucleotide. The nucleotide now has the 3' hydroxyl group required for adding additional nucleotides. More nucleotides are now added, and another becomes incorporated into the growing strand. The free nucleotides are washed away, and the new nucleotide is induced to fluoresce. The cycle can be repeated up to 100 times. The sequences from all the spots are recorded simultaneously. Software packages assemble overlapping sequence fragments into longer pieces, and in this way determine the overall sequence of a genome. And so once those sequence reads are generated, um, they're mapped against the curated library, as, as we mentioned, of those 50,000 microbes. Uh, the homology rate is around 99.7% per the, per the lab team. And this is an example of a report that's generated. It gives the species the relative abundance percentage um, of the entire 16S classifiable reads that are present. And I'd just like to highlight that often this doesn't add up to 100% because it's a proportion of all of the classifiable reads present and there's a read threshold and also a species detection threshold, perhaps 1% um, that's used for clinical reporting. Thank you very much. My UTI was chronic. All of the culture tests I took for years did not find the cause of infection. I was a week and a half from them amputating my foot. Current testing methods typically use cultures, a method that presents limitations in identifying key organisms known to cause chronic infections. As I would see my patients, I knew I wasn't helping them because we were limited by traditional cultures. Microgen DX is a better test than culture because it uses the DNA from your urine, sinus, wound, or other infected sample and matches it to their database of more than 50,000 species of bacteria and fungi with a 99% accuracy. So I was a week and a half away from not having a leg to being healed. Microgen DX gave me my life back. Ask your doctor about Microgen DX. If you're suffering from chronic or recurring urinary, sinus, wound, or implant infections, ask your doctor to use the most accurate testing available with Microgen DX DNA analysis. I'm just going to give a very brief sampling of uh, some of the applications of NGS in, in non-orthopedic fields, um, specifically specific to uh, diagnosing infection and identifying pathogens um, in other fields. So, yeah, so first, um, just like to go into uh, urology and the urinary tract infection, um, which has been one of the more exciting areas where NGS has really shown some benefit. Um, UTI, of course, a very, uh, very important problem, um, high, in, high incidence, uh, in the lifetime for, especially for adult women, and a very high recurrence rate, as well as uh, significant costs to the healthcare system. Um, somewhat analogous to, to the joint uh, and to PJI, um, the old dogma is that uh, the bladder, uh, much like the old dogma for the joint, is um, a sterile space where infection is a result of maybe a single invasive pathogen uh, in UTI, it's often E. coli into that space. 
Um, however, emerging evidence is really showing that uh, the bladder is a living dynamic system of uh, a changing microbiome and um, infection rather than just being you know, very simplistic um, you know, single organism invading that space. Um, it's really uh, showing that it's uh, you know, a disruption in that microbiome and um, you know, it's a much more complicated process. Um, and what, what we've been seeing is that uh, culture is really insufficient in identifying that, uh, that changing microbiome. Um, and there's you know, multiple, uh, multiple papers and a lot of literature that's showing this. This is just one example um, of a study out of the United Kingdom um, looking at uh, midstream urine cultures in patients with uh, UTI. And um, yeah, culture really failed to, fails to identify a lot of the uh, infections and a lot of the pathogens in these cases, whereas uh, genomic analysis um, does a lot better at, at identifying them. And then this is uh, one of the more recent head-to-head um, -head randomized uh, studies looking at treatment based on culture versus treatment based on NGS. And um, Karan will we'll get into it a little bit later. Where um, you know this is one of the more one of the things that we're looking to replicate in in orthopedics as well um, with the study comparing outcomes um, for culture. You know, Basing treatment on culture versus NGS, um, but yeah, this this was one in in urology with 44 patients with UTI sim symptoms. Um, culture was positive only in 13 of those cases, whereas there was positive NGS in all 44. Um, and most importantly, the outcomes were were much better, um, as you can see in this figure. Uh, the symptom scores for, for patients treated based on NGS was um, much higher at two weeks compared to those with culture. Yeah, so then um, this one is, is one that Alessina briefly mentioned. Um, this was a case report in New England Journal of Medicine looking at um, uh, meningoencephalitis, uh, many cases of which go undiagnosed. And it's a particular problem um, with the number of uh, the high number of infectious agents that can cause this disease. Um, so this case report was about a 14-year-old boy um, who had fever and headache for four months. Multiple workups were were negative um, for identifying any pathogen, um, but NGS uh, showed showed uh, leptospira. And this patient was successfully treated um, and then later on confirmed by the C CDC through uh, PCR and serologic testing to be the, the accurate diagnosis. Um, and then along those lines, a slightly larger, a larger trial, um, a one-year multicenter prospective study looking at NGS of the uh, cerebrospinal fluid for infectious meningitis. Um, again, showed that NGS was able to identify um, many of the, the infections that were um, not identified through clinical testing, through culture. Um, and they, they identified that treatment based on this information um, had a clinical benefit for, for many of these patients. Um, and then an, another field is uh, cardiology, where infectious uh, endocarditis um, is another major problem, one where uh, early and optimized antibiotic treatment is, is very important. And then, um, again, similar to, to PJI and, and to other areas of orthopedics, um, culture negative infection is, is a big problem. Um, so a couple uh, fairly recent studies uh, involving endocarditis. Uh, one is a case report showing um, that NGS was able to identify an infectious organism. And then another uh, larger study of uh, 44 patients um, which, as you can see, showed very high sensitivity of NGS compared to uh, compared to culture um, of, of many of the different uh, samples. Okay, and then lastly, um, looking at wound care, um, this is just a consensus guidelines uh, in in wound care showing that um, again uh, identify identification of microorganisms uh, through uh, genomic testing uh, in days one to four is very important. And um, a study from about 10 years ago of uh, almost 1,400 patients um, 
looking at treatment based on culture um, versus treatment based on uh, molecular diagnostics, either with uh, systemic diagnostics or um, guided topical antibiotics. Um, and similar to that head-to-head -head study with urology showed that uh, treatment based on NGS um, really had a beneficial effect um, in, in both groups treated based on uh, NGS compared to that of culture. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Microgen DX Miked Up. We hope that you found our broadcast informative and helpful. If you have any questions or would like to learn more about our services, please visit our website at microgendx.com. Power up your precision with Microgen DX testing, the key to accurate diagnostics and personalized treatments. Until next time, this is Microgen DX Miked Up signing off. <laughs>